even when we're undeserving, yet you are still faithful. Your glory reigns and we're able to commune with you and come to you as your children and ask of you anything that we have need of and know that you are good. Good Father will never leave us, never turn away from us. You're always there and we thank you, Jesus. How many agree that he is a good, good Father? Even if you had the best dad in the world, which I can think of my own, God is even better.
bask and worship him in that love that he has for us. Bishop mentioned this morning that even when we feel like we are so unworthy and we cannot stop messing up, God says you are perfect in this moment. Exactly who you are, striving to be the best you can be. You're perfect right as you are. And it's only a perfect God that can even say that about us. It's only a perfect God that can look at us and say, you're my child, you are perfect just as you are. Keep pressing, keep going. And that speaks to his undeniable love for us. Let's take a moment and just worship him in that undeniable love. God, we thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for your perfect love. For you are love, God. You cannot do anything but love us. And we thank you for not seeing us as we are, but as you intend us to be. Beyond our faults, you love us and see us. And we honor you, Jesus. Thank you for calling us deeper. For not giving up, but calling us to be closer to you. We're going to have prayer at this point in time. I'd like for you to remember a couple things in prayer that we talked about this morning. I'd like for you to remember uh, uh, Raymond Kramer, who is in the Washington Hospital Center. Uh, he's got infection in his heart and I believe other places in his body. So we want to keep him. That's Christina Pope's brother, in case those of you that may not know that. But he's, uh, he needs our prayers. Amen. He has come to church several times and, and sits with them over here and he grew up in church so we want to pray for him that God would not only touch his physical body but you know deal with his mind and spirit in Jesus name amen love to see him talking in tongues again amen amen uh, we want to pray for Sophie Randolph she has a need for God's favor in her life where is Sophie 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 there she is so she's right back here maybe some can gather around her amen and if you did not submit a request, but you do have a need, if you would stand at this moment. Sophie, go ahead and stand. If you would stand, if you have a need, 
so we can see who to come. We've got a couple over here. Brother Steve's got some needs. And anybody else? All right. And then, of course, at the end of our prayer, we want to pray for Pastor Sean, Sister Monique on their tra in their travels, Martin in St. Louis. Rain, of course, is with their mom. So we want to keep them in prayer. And at the end of prayer, before we stop praying, I do want to pray for Brother Tasker and his family. Uh, terrible news this morning that his wife, he's, past, he's pastored in Pocomoke City. It's down on the eastern shore for a long, long time. And uh, she passed away suddenly in the night. I don't know, know the details. Sister Libby got a text from uh, Bishop Wright that that occurred. So we want to pray for Brother, uh, Brother Tasker. I know there are children involved and, of course, the congregation there and, and ask God to touch in that situation. All right, let's stand together and go to these that are standing and have needs. Amen. Praise God. Ask them what their need is as you get near them. Someone can come and pray with Sierra. I don't know. She's right up here. She's got a headache. So she's walking to pray for someone else. But Sierra, just let somebody know you need prayer over there. I don't know. All right, let's pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy, Lord God. Blessed is your name, Lord Jesus. You see every need, Lord God. You see every need, Lord Jesus, in this building, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed is your name, Lord God. Touch, Lord God, the needs that you heard in your, in your hearing tonight, Lord. Sister Randolph has a need, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, give her direction in this situation. Lord God of heaven, move in this situation. Give her favor in the sight of men, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Lord, touch Raymond, God. Uh, not only touch him physically, Lord God, uh, but touch him in his spirit, Lord God. Uh, draw him closer to you, Lord Jesus. Uh, draw him closer to you, Lord Jesus. Uh, keep your hand upon Pastor Sean, Sister Monique, Rain, and Martin, Lord God, in their travels. Martin and his college, Lord God. Uh, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord God. Uh, Thank you, Lord God. And these others that have stood and expressed a need, touch Sierra's headache right now in Jesus' name. Heal Sierra in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, as we lift up your name, God. We lift up our faith to you, Lord God. You know how to touch people today, Lord. In the name of Jesus, these others that are praying right now, these other needs, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Now let's lift our hands and pray for Brother Tasker, his family, his church in this time of need. Lord, touch Brother George Tasker, Lord God, his family, his children, grandchildren. In the name of Jesus. Uh, this is a hard thing to understand, Lord God. But bring comfort to him even right now. Bless his congregation, Lord. Touch Frank. Help him be a, a helpmate to Brother Tasker in this time of need, Lord. Uh, comfort my brother, Lord God. Comfort his church, Lord God. Comfort his children, Lord God, and grandchildren. In the name of Jesus. Uh, we know Sister Tasker is with you, Lord God. Uh, but that doesn't bring comfort necessarily to those that are left behind, God. Uh, you can bring it. You're the God of all comfort, Lord. Uh, you're the God of all comfort. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Clap your hands for the Lord right now. As an admission that He's working in Jesus' name. He is working. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. But do not sit on your wallet. Hallelujah. Well, you may have to. And, but... We're going to receive an offering, so get ready to give. Ladies, 
just start digging in those purses, amen, for major bucks, amen. <laughs> oh, it's good to give to God. It's a sacrifice sometimes, but it is a needed sacrifice. When you bring your offering to the Lord, there are handouts. Pastor, who did a great job this morning, did he do a great job this morning? Amen. <laughs> Amen. He wants everyone, everyone to have one of these hangout, uh, handouts. And as you bring your offering to the Lord, sure, he'd like to explain what's going on here. The last section of the message was about the covering. Remember I talked, to, does anybody remember that I talked about the covering? The covering is the presence of God. When you are in the presence of God, you are in your covering. Okay? So these are special scriptures I was going to use and will somewhat day about the covering. These are a covering scripture. And I wanted you to have them to edify yourself this week by reading these scriptures that help you get in your covering. The other one was what? I hear that, that but I don't remember that being the other piece of paper. Hello? So what does it look like? Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. My bad. Okay. This is the Lord's Father, uh, the, the Lord's Prayer. The Our Father Prayer. And I was going to use this Friday night in our prayer uh, meeting, but I was detained in a, uh, uh, a meeting that I had. So this, Our Father, I'm going to encourage you to get this prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And pray this prayer every day this week. When you get to our Father, which is in heaven, you begin to thank God for being our Father, my Father. You're a good Father. I love you. You're a great Father. Does anybody believe that? Yeah. So I put this up here for you to take so you can go through that whole prayer every day this morning before you skedaddle and not go into your covering okay so if you'll pray the word and you'll worship god before you go out you're going to go in the the um covering now how many wants to be not covered this week oh good just don't do what i said today just skip it think you know you're better okay and Get in those covering scriptures. They will edify you. Okay? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So, to reiterate, there are two handouts, one on the right of the basket and one to the left. So you need to get both of those handouts. I'm going to spread these out a little bit so that we can help the flow of traffic as you come down. They're kind of cramped there. So pick one up on the right side as you're coming. Drop your hundred or three hundred or five hundred dollars in the offering, and then <laughs> pick up the one on the left, or your grand, whatever you got. Amen. All right, let's stand together. The musicians are going to play. Okay. Uh, they, you want them to see you? Okay. Uh, Pastor has some of the CDs from this morning. If you want one, absolutely free of charge, uh, you can grab one of those after church from him. He'll be right up here on the platform. Musicians, play a little tune. Ushers, guide the people to the offering plates.
much for giving this evening. Now stretch your hands toward the offering baskets and let's ask the Lord to bless this offering in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord God, for the giving of your people. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you will multiply it, meet the needs of the house of God, bless the congregation that's given, bless their finances as they've given to you. In Jesus' name, say amen. Some brief announcements, and then the choir is going to sing, and we have another special speaker this evening. Amen. Announcements. Save the date, ladies' conference, November 2nd through the 4th, right here at CLC. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Ladies, ladies' conference is always a great, great time for our ladies. So it'll be right here at CLC. You don't have to drive, travel, get a hotel. It's going to be right here. Amen. The 9th of September, speaking of ladies, there is a ladies' prayer walk meeting 8.30 a.m. That's a Saturday behind the Urbana Library. And what they do is they walk around the neighborhoods there of of choice and pray that God would deal with people in those neighborhoods and draw them to the house of the Lord. Thank you, Sister Johnson, for taking that burden upon yourself. She is in charge of that ministry. Uh, the 11th of September, Financial Peace will start a new class. <laughs> Brother Chris Titus heads that up with the Gobas, right? Are they still doing it? Amen. And uh, it is a great class for you to take if you need to know a little bit about budgeting your money, maybe you're strapped, maybe you have some issues, that will help you immensely. Amen. The 13th through the 17th of September, a lot going on in September, 13th through the 17th is a church-wide, it's for everybody, but it's, on the, it's a youth revival, concentrating on the youth, but everyone is invited. So this is the 13th through the 17th, it's a Wednesday and then I believe uh, Friday and I'm not sure Sunday, but uh, uh, Pastor Sean will give you update you that with more details when he returns. Right in the middle of that, on the 16th, a ladies' brunch starts at 10 a.m. It's a catered breast breakfast. Cost is $15. Tickets are available in the foyer. Monique Libby will be speaking. Amen. And that is good. September, still in September. We're beating September to death here. The 22nd through the 23rd district hyphen retreat. That's good. Our hyphen age group can get together. And then the 30th is Bible quizzing boot camp details are forthcoming. Say amen. Amen. We've got a lot going on, but you know what? It's good to be active in the things of God. Keep your hands busy about the things of the Lord. Amen. Because there's a lot of distractions out there. All right, choir, bless us this evening. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. We're about to worship the Lord vigor and excitement no matter what comes our way we're going to lift our voice and say hallelujah anyhow our bishop preached that this week we don't just get up from here or praise in here we need to take it out of these walls so remember the praise remember the worship we're doing now and then keep that with you amen and when you go to work when you go to school right we go. we're going to praise god amen
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Aren't you glad you're forgiven? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Before we proceed, uh, there are a lot of people traveling. A lot of people on the road. I know the Griffins are traveling a lot, driving all over this country. And there are other people traveling. We need to pray that the Lord would cover them. Talk about the covering this morning. So in a moment, we're going to pray that God would cover. Maybe some of your own relatives are on the road. And we're going to pray that God would cover them and keep them safe. And then we will hear from the word of the Lord in a moment. Amen. Will you do that with me? Amen. You don't need to stand, but let's, let's at least lift our hands and let's ask the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the covering. Thank you, Lord, for the covering, Lord. You will place on your people, put angels round about them, Lord Jesus. Keep them safe as they travel. Keep them safe as they drive, fly, whatever, Lord. In Jesus' name, you're able, Lord, to touch our church family. Keep them in your great and mighty hand. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said amen. I don't know that I've ever testified of this, but years ago, Pastor and I, traveled to Dallas, Texas for a training for the Christian school that we had here at one time. And I'm not the most happy flyer in the world. I don't like to fly. I like to drive. And they won't let me in the cockpit. So I remember I was a bit anxious about it. And the night before I had to fly out, and this just came to me, I don't know why, I hope it ministers to somebody. The night before I had to fly out, I had a dream. And I saw this air, jet aircraft, commercial aircraft, flying through the air, clouds just rushing by. And underneath, I'm getting chill bumps right now talking about it. Underneath that plane was a great big hand. And that was God speaking to me, letting me know that everything was going to be all right. Amen. Because I was a nervous little guy. Now, I was with him, so I know God wasn't ready to take him out. You know, I was pretty safe. And when I fly with Bethy, I'm okay, you know. I got to take her out. It's going to be all right. So it's just when I go by myself, y'all pray for me, all right? Amen. <laughs> I have to look for that big hand. Amen. Praise God. So God's got his hand upon and under the people that are traveling. And you remember them in your prayers. And again, pray for one another this week. And pastor's giving you tools to use. Let's utilize the tools. A great message this morning. The handouts you've been given, Lord knows what we're going to hear tonight. It may reinforce that. I'm not sure. But we do have a, a speaker tonight that I believe you're going to enjoy. Indeed, years ago, I can remember going to a neighborhood in Gaithersburg and picking up a young man. I don't know. I guess it was regular church or youth service. I can't remember. I don't remember. But Yvonne Ali has been with us for a number of years. And Chris Titus, her son is going to minister the word tonight. And let me tell you, when he got involved with the Spirit of God and God began to deal with him, he dove right in. There was none of this willy-nilly, well, I don't know. Okay. Well, I don't know. Okay. He was on it and in it. And we're so thankful that, that he is with us. He does a great job on our music. He found him a good wife. I don't know where she is or she's back there. Amen. <laughs> you hang on to the Lord, the Lord can find you a good partner. Amen. Somebody say amen. Sometimes we try to work it out on our own and get ourselves in a mess. But God knows. Amen. Everybody say God knows. But Brother Titus, you can quit the music. I mean, I have... Sure. The people are listening anywhere. You can just come on up. Yeah, I'm going to sing for a second. Oh, you're going to sing? Oh, all right. Let's welcome Brother Titus as he ministers in song and word. Amen. Can we just lift up our hands for just one more second and respond to the Spirit of God in this place? Lord, we love you. We magnify your name. And we're thankful for the opportunity to know you in spirit and truth. The Bible says that the Father seeketh such to worship him. Why don't we start our week off with some worship unto the Lord. In the name of Jesus, God, we magnify your name. 
You are holy and worthy and wonderful. And you deserve all of my praise. And I want to worship you, Lord Jesus. With everything in my being, with my whole heart, with my whole mind, with my whole soul, Lord, I love you. Let's sing this together. You are the love of my life. You are the hope that I cling to. You mean more than this world. You feel that way? I wouldn't trade you for silver or gold. I wouldn't trade you. For riches untold. Lift your voice and sing with me. You are, you are my end.
Come on, clap your hands to the Lord. You feel that way? We love you, Jesus. We magnify your name. Let me be seated for a moment. I want to uh, I wanna just share a little bit of my testimony. I want to testify tonight. Is that all right? And um, I uh, appreciate Pastor and his message this morning. And I was like, Lord, just confirm your word to me. And uh, it was really cool, Pastor, talking about all that he talked about, hiding in the Lord and, um, and having a relationship with him. And um, I, uh, I've mentioned it before, but I celebrate this November, November 22nd. Uh, I was filled with the Holy Ghost 1997, 20 years ago. And... You know, when I, you know, when I went at the five-year mark, I didn't really think about it. When I hit the 10-year mark, I didn't really think about it. But some, for some reason, this 20-year mark just made me think about all the many things that God has done in my life. And um, it just made me think like, wow. If this is what 20 years looks like living for the Lord, I wonder what 40 years looks like. And I wonder what 45 years looks like. Can you tell me? Good, huh? And you know, <laughs> you know, you're right. There are times where it doesn't feel as good. But I was, I was talking to my wife about uh, that scripture that says, all things work together for our good. And I thought it was really cool that um, it gave me a revelation of that, right? Because it's like, you, what do you, you know, like, well, I do have a bunch of bad things that happened in my life, right? And uh, I thought about all things work together for my good, working together. Trials are working together. Difficulties are working together. They're working together for my good. And one of the beautiful things that we have in knowing God is that things don't happen to us. They happen for us. And so there is a difference. See, when you're in the world, things happen to you. Trials, difficulties, circumstances, tragedies happen to you. But the scripture tells us that they're happening for us. So that's why we can rejoice in our tribulations. That's why we can have a smile on our face when we go through circumstance because trials and circumstances and difficulties are not happening to us, they're happening for us. They're working for us. You have your own business. You incorporate it. And every trial and a circumstance that you go through is working for you, building your faith, strengthening you and developing you in Christ. That's not my message. That's uh, what Pastor called uh, uh, adores. Uh, how do you say it? I uh, uh, can't say it. Adores, yeah. Our orders. I want to thank Pastor. Um, he probably doesn't remember this story, but uh, Brother Smith brought up my wonderful wife. And so I wanted to tell a quick story about an honor pastor in the story. But I would not be married to the wonderful wife that I am married to if it wasn't for him. And um, if he wasn't there in her life at a significant time, it's possible we would not be married today. And um, the story goes that my uh, father-in-law was kind of running on a little bit of hard times many, many, many years ago when my wife was a, a young person in our church. And, um, and so he had to send his children, his four children, back to their mother in St. Louis, Missouri. And um, my wife had just got the Holy Ghost and just came from, from camp and got saved and all that kind of cool stuff. And... Um, Pastor just did not want them to go to Missouri. He knew that they would be in an environment where they would not be saved and that they had just got the Holy Ghost. And so he commissioned the church to find them a place to live and to take them in. And so if my wife would have grew up in Missouri, I might have never met her. 
So I owe you a debt of gratitude for that. And I want to say, it speaks to the kind of man that he is. And oftentimes we don't hear all of the different situations, but many times he's come before us and said, hey, we have a special need and um, we need everybody to give. And this church has given and, and been a part of that. And so I want to thank him and I want to honor you as well. The, uh, the greatest place that I could ever preach is this place here amongst you all that I love and that, I, that have strengthened me and that we have worked together and developed together and that we have the same vision and goal and dreams to reach this area. And so it's an honor to stand in this pulpit. More than the honor of preaching anywhere else, I'm honored to be amongst family, amongst you all. I love you all. So I want to I wanna preach a very interesting message, and I want to share a couple of testimonies, personal testimonies. And I'm a storyteller oftentimes in preaching, so I apologize if you don't like a lot of stories. But I want to preach a, a, a message titled, God's Greatest Gift. If we can turn on our Bibles to Genesis chapter 15. And then if you have your Bibles, go ahead and put your thumb on James chapter 1. Verse 17, God's greatest gift. If you dare say amen. Genesis chapter 15, if you can put it on the screen for me, that would be wonderful. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. James chapter 1. Let's look at this scripture here. James chapter 1, verse 17. Verse, sorry, verse 17. James chapter 1, verse 17. I'm sorry, I might have given to the, sorry about that. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. While you're standing, why don't we just take a moment and just begin to pray and ask that God would speak to us in this very couple of moments here. In the name of Jesus, God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. God, give me clarity of thought and mind to be able to communicate what you have given me. I want to bless somebody. I want somebody to start their week off in you and in your presence, strengthened and developed and, and in their faith strong in your ability, God. You are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can actually think. And God, you are a good gift giver. And we thank you for your promises that they are yea and amen. We love you and we give you praise. You are truly the best thing that has ever happened to me. And I love you. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Amen. So I, I went on a, I went on a, yes, you may be seated. I went on a search for God's greatest gift. And we read in the scripture that every good and every perfect gift comes from God. And I wondered what is the greatest gift that God has ever given mankind? And as I went on this search throughout the scriptures, I realized and uncovered several contenders to the possible greatest gift ever given. It's very interesting that we serve a God that is, the Bible says, he daily loadeth us with benefits. That means every day that we move and we breathe and we are alive, the scripture says that he loads us with benefits. Maybe we don't see it, but it could have been a, a, a car crash that you did not get into. It could have been a, a bug that was carrying a virus that did not bite you. But every good and perfect gift comes from God. The Bible says that goodness and mercy follows us. So everywhere that we go, we are surrounded by and followed by goodness and mercy amazing gifts that we get from God. He is an amazing gift giver. 
You know, if he was a, if we could describe God, God is not the person that gives you, uh, you know, a, a gift card with, uh, you know, a, 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 um, a greeting card with uh, $5 in it. God is the kind of giver that gives the gifts that you wait for on Christmas. The really cool ones that are really wrapped, really tight, and that are at the back of the tree so that you don't know. I would think that God is the kind of gift giver. He's like a, he's like a grandpa. You know, grandpa, grandmas give great gifts, don't they? It's like they just love you more. I don't know why. Maybe it's like this is their second time around, and so they want to give good gifts. But grandparents get good gifts, and I believe that God is that kind of gift giver. I started to think about what could be the greatest gift that God has ever given. Easily one of the contenders of this gift could be salvation. Right? We've been bought with a price. We have been giving this, this, this gift in earthen vessels. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. And I'm a, I'm a big... Scripture giver, so I apologize if that's too much scripture for you. I heard uh, Reverend James, Johnny James say, if I give you a bunch of scriptures and the message flops, at least you got some word. So uh, if I give you a bunch of scriptures, then at least if my message doesn't go real good, you can't say you didn't get a word. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 says, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What a precious salvation. I remember when I, when I first, um, when I first, when the Lord started saving me, and this is my personal testimony, I, I was raised Muslim by my father and my mom and dad separated. Uh, then I still had some Muslim tendencies with some Christian spice on it. And so what I mean by that is that we still did not eat pork, and we still lived like Muslims, and we still associated with Islam. When we, went from, when we lived with my dad or when we saw my dad, he would take us to the mosque, and, and uh, we, would, we would have, you know, public school Monday through Friday, and then on Saturday we had, we would go to school and learn Arabic and learn how to be a good Muslim. And uh, when I grew up, I remember some of my childhood memories is, is going to the mosque on Saturdays and so, and and then as I got a little older, um, my mom, who was, who was from a Christian background, often had these friends from work that would invite her to church. And it was interesting. It was like I remember as a child, uh, and I hope I don't embarrass you, Mom. I love you. Speaking of which, her birthday just passed. Happy birthday. Belated birthday, Mom. She loves when I talk about her in the mic. She loves it. But growing up, I remember we would, four of us and a single mom, and we would just get into trouble. And she would say, you know what, I'm tired of this. Y'all going to church. And we would find some random local church to go to. And I remember as a young person, like going to the back of the closet to find this button-up shirt that I couldn't fit anymore because the last time I wore it was the last time I went to church. And so it would be tight around the neck, and it was tight around the sleeves, and my, my church pants was kind of up to here a little bit because it had been a while since we had gone to church because we went to church when we got in trouble. It's time to go to church. And we hated it because we had to put on that uncomfortable clothing, and it was always some kind of weird church that had, like, those wooden pews, and th there was no Sunday school. No kid zone. You had to just sit there and white gloves and all the traditionalisms that you think about. And I remember having to kind of suffer through two hours of just dead church. And uh, I remember as I, grew, as I grew up and I began to realize that, you know, there were some things that I knew. I, you know, I knew Adam and I knew Eve and I knew Moses I knew Moses really because the Ten Commandments came on TV every year. You guys remember that? It used to come on like every year. And so that's all I knew. But I knew that in Islam there was an Adam and an Eve, and in Christianity there was an Adam and an Eve. 
And then there was a Moses in Islam, and there was a Moses in Christianity. And I started to recognize that there were some comparisons, but I didn't understand what truth was. And I remember about 14 years old, looking up on my bed, 7925 Apartment H, Spiceberry Circle, otherwise known as the hood. <laughs> and uh, I remember looking up at my bed and just thinking, I've, I, you, we used to have these coloring books of Islam, coloring books when we would learn the five pillars of Islam and all the different things of that religion. And I remember looking up into my, uh, on my bed, looking up on my pillow and just saying, God, one day, I had two goals in life as a 14-year-old. One day, I want to figure out who you are, and the other one was I wanted to be a DJ. So God kind of just turned that around to piano. <laughs> and so, kind of worked that out. And so I remember looking up, and my, and my heart just said, God, one day I'm going to figure you out. And... I didn't realize that that one day was going to be closer than what I thought. I thought it would be like when I was 20 or 30. But just not too long after that, I remember being in the mall and I ran into Thomas Lim as a young person. And he just reached out to me. And uh, he connected with me. And I connected with him. And I started going to talk for teens. And I uh, started to see other young people that were serving God and living for God and, and okay with living holy. And I'm like, this is kind of weird because all of my friends want to do all this other stuff, and all these young people that are on fire for God, loving God. Like, who loves God? I want to pause and say, young people, you have an opportunity right now in your life to reach somebody. And if my, if Thomas Lim would have waited until he was older to do something for God, he would have missed out on an opportunity to be used by God to reach me. And so I remember coming to church, started with Talk for Teens, and then it turned into youth services. And then it was like, hey, well, why don't you just come on Sunday? I was like, cool, fine, awesome. And, you know, I still had a struggle, but there was a burning and a yearning and a desire. And I remember it took me three months to get the Holy Ghost. I covet you all that just come down here and just pray and the Lord just fills you with the Holy Ghost. I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't compute it with my Islamic mindset. I could not understand how God could come inside of me. And so when he did, he did. He changed me. He did a work in my life. He became a father in my fatherless situation, God began to save me. I don't know where I would be right now if it wasn't for the goodness and the mercy of God. What a gift. You know, you know it's very, very easy for us to forget. And it's one of the struggles that the children of Israel had that they begin to forget what the Lord did in their lives. I want to encourage us that it's important. Maybe you need to write it down. Maybe you need to share it because you haven't shared it in a while. But when God saves you, it's worth making sure that we don't forget that gift, that precious gift of salvation. Because I couldn't save myself. I couldn't deliver myself. I couldn't wash myself, but it was by his goodness and his mercy and his grace and his love towards us that he pulled us out of hell and saved our souls. Why don't we take a moment and just thank God for salvation. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you for purchasing me, adopting me, Lord. What an adoption. What a testimony. It should be forever on our hearts and burned and seared in our hearts. We should never forget the goodness of the Lord and his ability to save. You know, I think another contender is, is God's comforting voice. There's nothing like the voice of the Lord. The scripture says that the voice of the Lord is powerful, that the voice of the Lord is majestic. The comforting voice of the Lord can take you out of your situation and 
and, and completely turn you around. I remember we um, about seven or nine, I think it was about nine years ago, a um, couple of days ago, we celebrated this anniversary or we remembered this anniversary. But my wife was expecting her first child. And, um, and so we, uh, we were super excited. Actually, we were not excited originally. We were completely shocked and surprised and felt like our lives were over. Um, but once we got through that, um, being only married a year and then finding out that you're pregnant was like, whoa, ho, ho, ho. we're supposed to like have like this honeymoon season and it was like gone. And, and then I made the mistake of, I made the mistake of Googling, you know, how to be a good father and, you know, the cost of childbearing and all that. And I saw this statistic that said that the average newborn cost about 700 bucks a month. And I don't know how true it was, but it was true enough to freak me out because I was broke and poor and I didn't have 700 bucks. And that was before daycare. If you added in daycare, it was like 1,200 bucks a month. And I was like, Lord, what are we going to do? And I remember it just fueled this passion in me to work any hours I could. I took on extra jobs. I did side jobs. I, did, I, w- I would do anything that I had to do because I was freaking out that I was going to have to take care of and be responsible for this child. And I remember I worked after work. I worked on Saturdays. If I could get it in, I got it in. And we began to save up money, and it was wonderful. And we began to be super excited about the, the, the fact that we were pregnant and that we were expecting. And there's something about that feeling of expectation that you just feel so great and you're super excited. And uh, we found out we were having a girl, and I was super excited about that because you know, like, I didn't want to be, like, the father that, like, has the boy first and then has the girl so the boy can protect the girl. Like, I wanted the girl first because I was going to protect. Like, I had the shotgun ready. I had the first date planned. I had the wedding going. I couldn't wait till some guy was going. Like, I wanted to be that crazy dad. Like, I was ready for that. Like, that was my plan. I had it all planned out. I didn't want her to have a, a brother to protect her. I wanted to be her protector. I, I, I just saw the first date I was going to give him my keys and say, you take my car. And if you're not back by 10, I'm calling my car and it's stolen. Like, I had that planned out. And I was excited about having a girl. And, um, you know, it was a Thursday night. We were in the hospital, and, and we were feeling, she was feeling some type of uh, pains, and we didn't realize that it was contractions. And, um, you know, the, the, the short of it is that it became a very dark time for us. And I would probably say it was probably the darkest time I've ever been in. Um, and just, you know, full transparency, I... I probably went a year just completely numb, completely numb. I remember being in the hospital, and we, you know, the story was that it was about 21 weeks, and so there was no lung development. So the contractions started to happen, which means we had to go into labor, and they couldn't stop it. It was too late. So we knew that we were going to lose Natalie. And it was, I remember all these little dark things. I remember... Um, hearing the sound of other babies being born in other rooms. I remember, you know, once all the family and friends came with the comfort, I remember us cutting the lights off and trying to sleep, and we couldn't sleep because we kept hearing the joyous sounds of new birth and new life around us, but we were suffering with death. Like, I hate hospitals. Like, hospitals are like a faith killer. They would just suck the life out of you, the spirit out of you. And we were in that moment, and I remember uh, it it almost seemed like there was really no relief 
from the, the grief and the struggle and the difficulty and the expectation being completely destroyed. And I remember when they finally moved us from the labor and intensive care unit to, uh, to an actual room, and we could hear over the intercom them saying, um, you know, breastfeeding class in room 25, and we realized we couldn't go to that class. And I, I can even remember hugging each other in comfort and realizing that there was nothing in between us anymore. It was a really dark time for us. Very, very dark. And I remember probably for about a year, I was numb. I was, I was behind the organ, and, um, but I was numb. I put the mask on. But I remember it, it really, it, it's like if you could picture God in a colorful picture I knew God. I knew the truth. I wasn't going anywhere because I had nowhere else to go. I only knew God, right? I was like the disciples. I was like, where else can I go? But it was like that colorful picture and imagery of God turned into a picture of gray. I believed God, but I wasn't sure if my prayers were worth it, to say the least. It was like I remember praying for individuals and I would just say, well, if God wants to do it, because God's going to do whatever he wants to do. And there was this kind of bitter grief where I was praying and I was believing, but I was ultimately saying, you know, God, you're sovereign and you're going to do whatever you want to do. So why even really bother to ask you? I was in a very dark place. And... Um, me and my wife, we developed these, these little ways of helping each other. Pastor says, Pastor Libby said something to us in the hospital. He said, uh, you know, it, it, will get, it will gradually get better, and you're going to cry a lot, and you're going to, but you're going you're gonna to work through it, and you're going to heal. And um, he says, and you're going to grow your relationship with your wife even more. And that was really awesome advice, and we did. It was amazing. We learned how to be sensitive to each other like I had never learned um, outside of that experience. And so we knew, like, to always answer each other's calls. And we knew the slight uh, change in voice. And we knew what that meant. We knew that we were thinking about Natalie. And no matter where we were, we stopped. And we gave each other that moment to cry or to mourn. And we grew um, as in our relationship because we learned how to love each other and be what each other needed through this difficult time. And I remember, you know, uh, the first person that was actually on the scene to this, this situation at the hospital was Sister Monique. I don't know why, but I wound up calling her for something. And I told her that we were in the hospital. And at this point, we didn't know um, where we were at. We just knew that, you know, they were still going to try to save Natalie. And so she, we were like, I think we'll be okay. I think it's just fine. She says, no, I'm going to come. And so she came, and so she actually was in the room when all of this stuff conspired. And my wife reminded me of part of one of those miraculous things that God does in the midst of situations is Sister Monique just began to be Sister Monique, right? And so she just began to minister in the, with, uh, unto the Lord and just start singing, you give and take away. But blessed be your name. And quite honestly, for me, I don't even really remember that part of the story. Because the, the process has already started. To, the numbing had already begun to start. And I really didn't understand what I was going through. But later on, our doctor had uh, wrote us this lovely note. And she basically said in the note that she could not believe the kind of love that our church and that we were as a body of Christ and she says, I know this is a difficult time for you all, but you will not, you, I'll never forget this experience. And she began to start coming to our church because of it. And if I'm, I don't remember the story correctly, but I think she even got the Holy Ghost here. Uh, she did not, okay. But she began to come and she began to partake of just because of seeing the love that we had for each other and the love that Sister Monique and the love that Pastor and the love that all of our church and family had gathered around us during this time. And I'm sure she had probably experienced other uh, 
situations like this, but there was something that was significant. And uh, I thank God for that because we were able to, you guys were able to be a blessing to someone who did not know the Lord in this situation. And the Bible says that. The Bible says that they will know me by your love towards one another. When we love one another, they will see it. It will be a testimony to them. And so I probably went about a year where I was absolutely numb. And I remember uh, we had one, it was in the old building. And if you remember the old building, there was a balcony that was here. And there was this brown clock that used to sit. Right? Remember, remember that? And so uh, I was on the organ, which was over here. And Sister Monique was on the keyboard, which was over there. And we were having one of those blowout services where there was not going to be any preaching and everybody knows it because we're already there. The Holy Ghost is moving. The power of God is falling. And it's like, we're not going to have no preaching. We're just not going to have no preaching. Like, you know those kind of services? We just have one of those kind of services. And I was just playing the organ like, mm, God doing it again or whatever. And I was numb. And I knew what God was doing. But I had this grayness, this vision, this imagery of God that just was totally grayed out. I couldn't see any color. And I remember uh, that morning, uh, me and my wife had woken up, getting ready for church. And she was, she was pregnant with my son, Ethan. And so that morning before service, she had turned to me and she said, do you know where we at right now? I was like, no, what's going on? She says, well, we're at the same place in this pregnancy that we was with the last pregnancy. And we were about a week difference from where we were at. So we basically were at the same time in the same place. And we had never gone past this point. We had never known what was outside of 21 weeks of pregnancy. And so the harsh reality of it being a year's past and the harsh reality that we were uh, 21 weeks and we had never gone past 21 weeks and this grayness about us that says, you know, God's going to do whatever he wants to do. Why even bother? Why even get excited? Why even, why even care? Because God's sovereign. He's going to do whatever he wants to do. And we woke up and we were carrying this heaviness to church. And it, was, it just sealed even more the hardness that was beginning to happen in our lives. And I was playing the organ. And then the church was awesome. And all of you guys were shouting and praising God. And I was like, let's go get some chicken. I'm being honest. Anybody ever been there before? And I remember God is moving, and I'm like, God, you move. Yeah, bless everybody. Bless them. I'll play the right chords. I'll play the right song. I'll, I'll do the right jig. I'll hit the right scales. I'll hit the right notes. You bless them, but I'm just going to sit here and just know that you're going to do whatever you want to do, and I'm not going to worry. And there was, this, there was this hardening, this cratering that was happening. And I was playing the organ, and Sister Monique looked over to me, and, and because I'm because I play a lot on the platform, I've, I've uh, developed a really good ability to read lips. It's one of those things that you just get from always talking when you can't hear somebody. And um, Sister Monique was on the keyboard, and the Holy Ghost was moving, and Pastor Jean was exhorting. And she said, where is Jackie? But she was actually saying. And at that time, Jackie was in choir. But she wasn't in choir. She was late, and she missed choir. And I thought, ooh, Jackie is going to get it. Sister Monique is going to rebuke her. She is in trouble. Sister Monique don't play. And she was late, and she's not in the choir. Ooh. So I'm on the organ, and I'm like, and I, Jackie used to sit over here, and I'm looking for Jackie, and I don't see her. And I'm like, yes. I don't have to lie. I don't know where she's at. So I looked at something and I was like, I don't know where she's at because she's not in her seat. And so Sister Monique was like, where is Jackie? And so I'm still kind of looking for her. And I can't find her. I have no idea where she is. 
And she looked at me, where is Jackie? And then I looked underneath the clock, and there was Jackie in the shadows in the back by the door, same place I was in. Just dry and calloused, hardened over. And at this point, I got to tell Sister Monique where she is because now I see her and now I know and I can't lie. So I, I look at Sister Monique and says, oh, she's under the clock. And so Pastor Sean is here. And she's flagging down Pastor Sean, playing with the one hand, flagging him down. He's exhorting. He finally realizes his wife is trying to say something. He walks over to his wife on the piano, and he, she had to say about four words to him, and he immediately beelines to Jackie. And I'm like, oh, no, now she is really in trouble. And I thought, I just got my wife in trouble. I'm going to be in trouble now, too. And Pastor Sean leaves the platform. He goes directly to Jackie. She lifts up her hands. He lays hands on her and begins to speak to our situation. We told nobody. No one knew. Nobody. Nobody knew we were at 21 weeks. Nobody knew that we were on the, first, the, the year of, the, it had been a year's past. Nobody had knew the heaviness that we were dealing with. I talked to somebody afterwards. I said, why don't you do that? The Lord led me. The Lord told me to. And it was like immediately I heard the voice of the Lord. And it was like the Lord was saying to me, I'm with you. I'm going to be with you with this pregnancy. I never left you. I know where you are. It was an amazing God moment for me. Because nobody knew what we were going through. But the Lord, with his powerful, majestic comforting voice reached down and said, I know exactly where you are and I love you and I'm with you. In that moment, the voice of the Lord spoke to me and it just began to stop the callousing and stop the bitterness and stop all of the, all of the grayness and the color began to come back and I began to see God as he was, my comforter. I don't know about you, but that's a great gift. You know, I think, I think that heaven could be possibly a gift that we could say would be the greatest gift. John chapter 14, let's look at this scripture. John chapter 14, verse 1. And I'm sorry about the Dino, you did a wonderful job helping me out here. And I, I think I'm kind of moving all around a little bit, but you're doing great. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Next verse. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Heaven. You know, sometimes walking this journey, I just, I feel like Brother, brother, brother Ramsey. Brother Ramsey used to be in my life group when we were in Germantown. And he would come into the, the youth, he would come into the life group and he would say, I'm just waiting on my wings. Just waiting on my wings. Right, Brother Ramsey? Just waiting on my wings, you know. Trials, this is a man that knows trials and knows difficulty and knows how to smile in the midst of it. And he would come into life group and he said, just waiting on my wings. Just can't wait to get home. Can't wait to get out of here. And sometimes, you ever felt that way where you're like, I just can't wait to get to heaven? I just want to see his face. I just want to be in his presence. I just want to be away from sickness and death and difficulty and struggles. And I just want to be in heaven. I think that heaven could possibly be the greatest gift that God gave us. But then I think other religions have paradise. Other religions have a place that they call heaven. If heaven... If we, if we want to talk about the greatest gift, what would make us different than the Muslims that believe in paradise? Or the Hindus or other religions that believe that when they die, they're going somewhere. I don't think that heaven really distinguishes us from other religions. And I think that there is a greater gift than salvation. I think there's a greater gift than God's comforting voice. I think there's a greater gift than heaven itself. 
And I think it's found in the scripture that we read earlier, Genesis 15, chapter 1. And we see Abram, and Abram has just gone to war, and Abram has just gone through some difficulties. And it says, after these things, these trials, these circumstances, the war that he had to go into to save Lot, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield. And then it says this, I am your exceeding great reward. You know what our greatest reward is? I'm about to blow your mind. This is super profound. When somebody says that, that means it's not super profound. Our greatest reward is God. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16. See, I think that Enoch understood it. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God and was not. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And if you stay there, because I'm going to go back to 15, verse 1 in a second. But it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. Uh, verse 5. I'm sorry. See, I told you I'm going to give you some words so that you can say you got a word. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation... He had this testimony that he pleased God. And the scripture says in Genesis about Enoch that he walked with God. What an amazing testimony. See, to have that kind of testimony, it meant that everybody that was around Enoch knew that Enoch walked with God. They looked at him and said, oh, that's Enoch. That's the man that walks with God. He had a testimony that he walked with God. You know, it's interesting because then it says that he was not. So when they recorded that Enoch was not anymore, you know, like if I, if I didn't show up tonight, probably the first thing that would happen is you would call me. And if you couldn't get a hold of me, you would maybe look for where I had been. And then possibly after that, you would probably try to figure out by calling the police some type of manhunt. Hopefully you guys love me enough to look, to look for me. But you probably wouldn't think, oh, yeah, God took him. You probably wouldn't think, oh, he went with God. But the people of Enoch's day recognize that Enoch not only walked with God, but when they saw Enoch no more, they knew exactly where Enoch was. And I want that kind of a testimony where when people look at me, they say, that's a man that walked after God. See, he was able to be a light and a testimony and an example to his generation because he walked with God. Not because he was a, that he was a success, not because he was an entrepreneur, not because he had multiple different degrees. But when they saw Enoch, they knew he walked with God. And when they didn't see him, they knew he was with God. I want people to have that kind of testimony towards me. Don't put on my stone that I was a success or an entrepreneur. Don't put on my stone that I was a good father. Put on my stone, my grave, that I walked with God. I want that to be my testimony because I believe that is the greatest opportunity that we have. We are saved so that we can walk with him. He speaks to us so that we can walk with him. He gives us heaven so we can walk with him. What an opportunity, what a great privilege to be like Pastor said this morning, to be hid under God, covered by the Lord, walking with the Lord. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. It's interesting because we see here that Abram is having a struggle. He's having a difficulty. He's got some mountains in his life. And the scripture says that, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham, and it says, I am your shield 
and thy exceeding great reward. But look at Abram's response. Verse 2. And Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me? He missed it. He absolutely missed it. God says, I'm your reward. Abram says, what are you going to give me? And I think we find ourselves in that same predicament where we say, well, God, what are you going to do for my situation? How are you going to change my circumstance? How are you going to fix this situation? And God is saying to him, I am your reward, Abram. See, Abram had blessings that the Lord had given him. He said, I'm going to bless your going, I'm going to bless your going, and I'm going to bless those that bless you. I'm going to bless, I'm going to cause you to be a blessing to the nations. He looked at Abraham and said, look at the stars and see how, see if you can number them. That's how I'm going to make your name great and make your people great. And, and look at the sands of the sea and, and see all these great things. And, and Abram got caught up in the blessings and forgot about the blesser. Because our greatest reward will never be what God gives us. Our greatest reward will be the opportunity to walk with him. To walk in his presence. You know, we all struggle with mountains and difficult situations. Anybody got a mountain in their life? A struggle, a difficult situation? You know, I found this really cool scripture in the Bible. And this is so off the notes. I'm sorry about the deal. You're doing a great job. I appreciate it. I told you, I'm going to give you a bunch of word. So you can't say you didn't get a word. Mark chapter 11, verse 23. And we all deal with difficult situations in our life. We all deal with mountains, struggles, challenges, issues, right? Financial issues, marital issues. And look at this scripture I found. The Bible says, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say Unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. The scripture tells us that when a mountain comes in our life, that we should speak to the mountain. We should tell that mountain, be removed. And the scripture gives us a promise that if we hold true to that and we don't doubt in our heart, he shall have whatsoever he saith. And I thought about my situation and my mountains and my difficulties. And I thought oftentimes I go to prayer speaking to God about my mountains. And I go to God and, uh, you know, we call it, I, I, I call it, uh, crisis prayer, right? You're in a crisis. And isn't it interesting that when we are in a crisis, we pray harder than we would normally pray? If it's sunny outside, we give the Lord five minutes, a two-minute song, and then we go off to work. But if you're in a crisis, you'll wake up at 5.30 to seek the Lord because you want him to work out your situation. And so oftentimes we crisis prayer rather than Christ-centered prayer. And many times God has to take us through a crisis so that he can get our attention. I don't want God to have to get my attention with the crisis for me to walk with him and to spend time with him. But I thought this was very interesting because, this, because Jesus is saying here, whosoever shall say to this mountain. But oftentimes what we do with mountains is we take them to God. God. Why is this mountain in my life? Why is this struggle in my life? Why is this difficulty in my life, God? Why am I struggling with this? Why are my kids X, Y, and Z? Why is my finances the way they are? And the scripture tells us to not speak to God, but to speak to our mountain. See, sometimes we speak to God about our mountains, and we should be speaking to our mountains about our God. 
Sometimes you don't need to take that to prayer. You need to take your situation to your mountain. And you need to say, mountain, be removed because I know a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can actually think. But let me tell you the answer, the solution to that. We can't go to our mountains and speak to our mountains about our God if we don't spend time with him. If we don't learn how to walk with him, see, when you begin to walk with him and you begin to love and connect with him and he begins to calm and his voice speaks to you and he gives you peace that passes all understanding and he gives you joy that's unspeakable, you can now go back to that mountain, not with a bad attitude, not with a complaining spirit, but with faith and believing that as you speak to that mountain, that mountain begins to move. I want to tell somebody, sometimes you can't talk to God about your mountain. You got to go talk to your mountain about your God. And so Abram finds himself where we often find ourselves. Struggling with the reality that God wants us to see him and our relationship with him as the greatest gift that's ever been given. You know, I love, I love the kind of music that we, that we, we sing around here. But I kind of joke. I call it, um, anybody know what Captain Planet is? If you're an 80s baby, you know Captain Planet, all right? Earth, wind, fire, water. You know, I, I, I kind of feel like some, sometimes this newer age music that we sing and we play and we love and God ministers and God blesses. Don't get me wrong. But I think some of the newer stuff is like it's all about air and water and oceans and fire, right? It's like God is the air and he's coming on the oceans and he's living water and he's going to bring fire down from heaven. And we love the elements for some reason in this generation. Like Captain Planet. I want to just be like, earth, wind, water, fire, Captain Planet. Because we love, for some reason, these elemental songs, these songs that are talking about the elements. I'm waiting for somebody to write a song about dust or dirt, or rocks, right? Cover the earth with your glory. But I think that some of the older songs got it right. I think some of the older songs took you to a place that some of these newer songs can never take you. I remember those old Tuesday night prayer meetings with Brother Doyle. And we would... And nobody cared that we had we were there Tuesday night and Thursday night and Wednesday for choir, Saturday for whatever, and cleaning ministry. Now we all kind of care about too many night stuff, but we didn't care. And those Tuesday night prayer meetings, I remember Brother Doyle would lead them, my Brother Smith would lead them, and Pastor Libby would lead them. And, and then we would, we would just go off and get lost in God's presence. Get hid. And then one of the old elders would start singing, not old elders, but one of the elders would start singing, just to walk with him means everything to me. Just to know his hand is there, that is leading me, though the world may pass me by. I learned those songs in an old prayer meeting. And I developed this desire that if anything is said of me, let it be said that I walked with God. Though the world may pass me by, go their way, let me be. Just to walk with him means everything to me. And then somebody would start singing, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own, 
and the joy we share. I want to tell somebody tonight, the greatest thing you could ever do is develop a relationship with God. Where you don't just have a religion, where you just clock in and clock out, but you say, God, I want to walk with you. I don't want my deepest and strongest and powerful prayer meetings to be centered around crisis and trauma and situations. But I want to come boldly before your throne. I want to come willingly before your throne that I can walk with you. Can we just worship God for just a moment? God, I want to walk with you. I want it to be my testimony that I walked with God. Come on, let's lift up our hands for just a moment. I want this to get down into your spirit. I want it to get into your heart this week that you will become convicted in your heart if you give a five-minute careless prayer that this week you will deepen your prayer time with God. It's the greatest gift that we have that we can walk with him, that we can talk with him, we can tell them you're my own. Hallelujah. 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 I want to walk with you. See, difficult... It's not too late. we got a couple of minutes. Why don't we just make this place a, a place of prayer? And I want you to step out of your aisles a little bit. And I want us to practice just walking with the Lord. Why don't we just turn this into one of those old Tuesday night prayer meetings. Without any music, without any pumping, without any priming, without any, anything to, to lead you and guide you. Why don't we just have a moment of prayer? Why don't we say, God, I'm coming to you not with a crisis situation, but I'm coming to you to be in your presence in the name of Jesus. God, help us this week to take our prayer life serious. In the name of Jesus. God, I don't come to you with a need. I don't come with you with a circumstance. I come to be in your presence. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, lift up your voice. Hallelujah. 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 Just to walk with him means everything to me. Just to know your hand is there leading me in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I want to walk with you, Lord. I want to walk with you, Lord. I want to be in constant communion with you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. They that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Let's abide under the shadow of the Almighty for just a moment. Come on, start your week off with a commitment to a deeper level of prayer. Maybe you pray for five minutes and you're going to say, I'm going to pray for 10 minutes. Or maybe you pray for 15 minutes and you say, I'm going to pray for 25 minutes. But God, I want a deeper relationship with you. 
in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, we got to learn to pray deeper in our prayer closets than we pray in this altar. We got to learn to pray in our prayer closets, in our homes, longer than we pray in these altars. God, convict our hearts about prayer. Take us to a new place in prayer, Lord, that we can stay and walk in your spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who walk after the Spirit. Lord, we walk after you today. We want to be hid in you, Lord Jesus. We want to be hid in your presence. Hallelujah. 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 If you feel led, why don't you put your hand on someone's shoulder? Why don't you pray for someone? Come on, let's, let's lift each other up and let's strengthen each other. We're all in different places in our walk with God, but we can fuel somebody's prayer time and fuel somebody's relationship. Jesus, we need you. Help us to not be like Abram, Lord Jesus. Help us to not miss the greatest gift that you have given us, that we get to walk with you. We get to walk with you, Lord. We get to walk with you, Lord Jesus. I agree with Pastor. We need to speak in tongues more. We need, to pray, we need to pray in the Spirit. Come on, let's pray in the Spirit for a little bit. Let's get under the pavilion of the Lord. Let's get under the shadow of the Almighty. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hide us this week, Lord. Hide us in your presence this week, Lord. Hide us under your anointing this week, Lord. Help us, Lord Jesus, to speak to the mountains from a relationship with you. From the depths of our walk with you this week, let us get the joy that we need. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's keep praying. Come on, you're praying for someone who needs your prayers. You're praying for someone who needs your strength. Let's strengthen each other. Let's lift up one another in this place. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. God, I want to walk with you. I want to walk with you like never before. I want to walk so close to you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Call us to prayer, Lord. Call us to prayer, Lord Jesus. Help us to turn off the media. Help us to turn off the social media. Help us to turn off entertainment, Lord Jesus, and go deeper in prayer. There's somebody that's depending on our walk with God. There's somebody that's depending on our testimony that we walk with the Lord. In the name of Jesus, call us to a deeper place in you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to challenge you today. Can I give you a challenge? Some of you know what your prayer life looks like. Maybe you're a 15-minute person. Maybe you're a five-minute person. Maybe you're an hour person. Whatever it is, it's okay. There's no shame in it. But I want to challenge us. 
Get that figure and that number in your mind, whatever that is. Maybe you're a five-minute person. Maybe, you, maybe it's consistency for you. And I want us to commit. See, Enoch's, there was a generation that was looking at Enoch. And there's a county and there's a city that's looking at us that we can have the testimony that we walk with God. It's bigger than us. I walk with God is bigger than us. It's about those that we're going to be able to reach. It's about God's ability to be, to use us and us to be sensitive to God's spirit and to know, stop, stop. Pastor talked about us all getting so, having all these difficulties and struggles and we work so much and we got to get groceries and we have all these errands that we have to do. But that walk with God will cause you to be sensitive and, 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 and direct you and say, go pray for that person. And if we don't have a prayer life or we don't have a sensitive walk with God, God can't speak to us and use us and lead us to that individual. That literally happened to me on Saturday. I was going to get some groceries and I saw this guy and he had these scars on his face and he had these patches on his face. And I, it was like the Lord was telling me the love of God, the comfort of God. I said, go back and pray for him. And I tell you what, he was blessed, but I was blessed too. Because I got to connect with somebody. I got to be sensitive to God's spirit. There's a generation that's waiting for us to have a walk with God that's so deep that we can be sensitive. And even though we got to go to the cleaners and even though we got to go grocery shopping, we can say, "Uh, God wants me to pray for that person. You were that person. We all got here because somebody reached out to us. Somebody had a walk with God. And it's time for us to have that walk with God. I want to challenge you today that you say this week, if I'm a 15-minute person, I'm going to kick it up. I'm going to be a 20-minute person or a 25-minute person. If you're a 20-minute person, you're going to say, I'm going to hang in there for another 10 minutes or another 15 minutes. I'm going to make an effort to take my prayer to a deeper level. I want to also challenge us that we, that we really take stock of our time. I can spend hours on social media, forgive me, Lord, but I can. And some, we need to be convicted. I need to be convicted to say, you know what, how can I only spend 15 minutes in prayer, but I can spend two hours on Facebook? How can I spend only five minutes praying, but I can spend X, doing X, Y, and Z? We were not called to be social media lurkers. We were called to walk with God. So I want to challenge you. I want to challenge us. I'm challenging myself. I want you to get that, that whatever that is in your brain. If you're a 15-minute person, maybe you're going to 20 minutes. Or maybe you're going to 25 minutes. And I want us to pray specifically that God would help us, that God would call us to prayer, that he would remind us of our commitment. I want us to make a commitment today. Is that all right? Is that okay? Before we leave the house, got to do it. Is that all right? All right, I hear over here, but I'm kind of getting scared. Is that all right over here? Thank you. All right, let's take that figure and let's begin to pray that God would, that let's make a commitment to the Lord and let's pray that God would help us with that commitment. Let's pray. In the name of Jesus, Lord. I make a commitment to you to put you first, to seek you early, to rev up my prayer life, to make sure that before I leave the house, I'm covered by your presence, that I'm walking out in the fullness of the Holy Ghost, that I don't leave my home unless I put on the armor of God, unless I'm covered and I'm hid by you. Lord, I pray that you would help me and that you would cover me that you would strengthen me, that you would convict me if I put anything in place of that commitment that I'm making to you today. Help me, Lord Jesus. Help me, Lord God, to be, to be the person that you've called me to be. I want to be sensitive to your spirit. I want you to easily be able to speak to me and tell me exactly what to do. Lead me, God. Be in the midst and help me, Lord. I want to walk with you. 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 Amen. Amen. But simply at this point, I would get behind the keyboard and I would play a really cool song. But unfortunately, it's kind of hard to 
preach and to play at the same time. Uh, but um, why don't we just sing a song really quickly? Is that all right? Sister Danny, where you at? She hates when I do this, but I'm a, I'm a bad keeper. So why don't you come up here and help me sing? There she is. This is my little sister, and I love her so much. Uh, j- uh, let's sing that old song that we were singing. Just a walk with him means everything to me. Just to know his hand. Give us the words. His there is leading me. Though the world may pass me by, close their way. Let me be just Just to walk with him means everything to me. Lift your hands and receive this. Just to know he's there, his hand is leading me. Though Clap your hands up to the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you all. I love, I love my church. Like I said, I really believe I, it's the greatest honor I have is being able to be in this pulpit. And I, I honor you all. And I appreciate you guys being able to receive from me. I am blessed. And our church is blessed. You guys are a blessing. From every spiritual mother that has ever popped me on the bottom or popped me upside the head. For every male that's in this room that uh, is a leader, I appreciate you all. God bless you. God bless you. Have a good week. I'll see you Wednesday night. Use the tools that you've been given today. The word. This morning, the word this evening, the handouts, you've got tools to use. Let's seek the Lord this week. Let's be hid in God. God bless you. Pastor has CDs. If you want a free CD of the message, he's handing them out right now. You better grab one. Amen. See you Wednesday night.